Mm-hmm. Okay, so AXI is a really simple RM. Um, actually, I'm probably just going to write with me facing down. So I'm gonna yeah, that's okay. So... setting is we have some sequence of input bits. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an algorithm A chilling here. We have input at 0, at 1, at 2. It's a stream. And then we have output for a 1, 0, a 1, a 2. And this works in the obvious way, right? He sees input 0, he outputs output 1, 0. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, so the algorithm is going to be a maintains distribution over programs that map. Um, so it's going to model the world as being another step, which takes its actions and then returns the next input. Right. So the world produces this first input, then A produces the first output, then the world produces the next input, which mm -hmm. shows to A. Um, and so we could imagine this as being like A is a computer, W is everything else in the world. This is the input wire from the computer. This is the output wire. Okay. Right. So physics does all of this stuff, and then yeah. the algorithm A is running in some sense does this. And it's not really clear how you split things up exactly, which will become problematic in a bit. So A maintains a distribution over possible worlds, W. Right. Um, so uh, do you know much about... Like, algorithmic information theory, there's really not much deep there, but do you know the definitions? Uh, such as? Like a Slominoff induction, Kolmogorov complexity. Yeah, Kolmogorov complexity I'm familiar with. Okay, so yeah. the universal prior is just this thing weighted by 2 to the negative mm -hmm. complexity. Okay, so um, it starts with like description length weighted, whatever, uniform distribution over programs. Let's put that in quotes. Um, obviously, by uniform, I mean like in some prefix free encoding. Mm -hmm. So, like the shorter programs are more likely. Okay. Um, so, we start with the uniform distribution over programs and then condition on agreement with observations. Right, so. Um, Amongst all possible programs for the world, only some would have produced uh, the sequence of inputs that we've observed in response to the outputs that A is in fact mm -hmm. provided. So we just condition this uniform distribution on agreement with that data. Right. Um, so it's step K. And unfortunately, I'm going to completely diverge from the notation in the original paper, so I haven't written it in a really long time. So it's step K, and I may even make some technical errors. Maintain UK. This is like the distribution over possible worlds. Okay. Right. Okay, so then the question is, how does A, A now is considering what's output in the kth step. Um, it's seen inputs, yeah, 0 to k minus, or 0 to k. Uh, it has this distribution over possible worlds, so how does it choose what output action to take? It just does, like, the easiest thing. Um, right, so one thing to do would just be to take, well, so let's augment the input with a reward signal. We haven't yet given A any goals, so this is sort of an unhelpful formalism. So now we're going to, along with the input at each step, you receive a reward signal. And the goal of A is just going to be to maximize the reward signal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, now, once we have this reward signal, we have a model of our worlds. The worlds produce both inputs and reward signals. It's just going to choose the action which maximizes the expected reward in the appropriate step. So select the output in the case step is going to be the argmax over all possible actions A of the expectation under the distribution mu k of the world's out. I'll write this as um, the reward k plus 1 mm -hmm. conditioned on um, a k equals a. Does this make sense? Okay, so for, let's see, so you're saying here is the expectation over this distribution, um, and you're taking this over all possible action. Um, so yeah, this, is, uh, this notation is really lying a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so this is choosing a program to take the place of worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And so such a program takes as input all of the actions that have occurred so far, and then produces the next output of rk plus 1, ik plus 1. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so when, I, when I'm conditioning here, I'm not really conditioning. I actually mean like if you set, so for each program, if you set the kth action to be A, uh -huh. then you could run that program to see what the reward would be. Right. right. Okay, okay. So we're just saying set the kth action to be A, like temporarily, as uh -huh. a hypothesis, then take the average over all possible worlds and see what your reward would be. Mm -hmm. Compute this quantity for each different action you could choose and choose the limit maximum. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Right. So this is sort of the simplest algorithm. Yeah. Um, this is kind of silly, this algorithm, mm -hmm. um, because it's just like very greedily maximizing reward. Like it's only doing it for the next step. Um, so basically, all AXI does is it looks ahead for some horizon H. Like it looks ahead to the next H steps and tries to maximize this total reward over those H steps. Um, so it just, instead it chooses, this is like short-sighted. Instead, pick AK equals argmax of um. Petition in EK over RK plus 1 plus RK plus 2 plus plus RK plus H, given that uh, AK equals A, mm -hmm. and additionally, um, AK plus 1 equals, and then here, so this is, it starts off just the same, right? We say, if I made my next action equal to A, then what would the next reward be in expectation over all these models? Mm -hmm. But then to look ahead k steps, we also have to model our own behavior over that period. Um, so we just said, we assume a k plus 1 is going to be equal to another argmax, right? I see. Um, conditioned on i k plus 1 and so on. Um, so what I mean is that we can take this whole definition and sort of just shove it inside here to define the action k plus 1, because mm -hmm. we know we're going to be running the same algorithm on the next step. And then we can use this to define our action in all the subsequent rounds. And then once we've defined our own action in the subsequent rounds, we can uh, calculate the expected reward would be. Okay. And we're taking into account that in subsequent rounds we'll have observed additional input. And so our model in the next round for the possible world will be different. Because it will have observed one new piece of information, which will have allowed our future selves to change the distribution over possible worlds. I see, I see. Okay. Um, so does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that's all AXI does. Okay. That's sort of like the most naive possible thing, in some sense. But it took a while. It's fairly recent, for whatever reason. Um, hmm. Surprisingly simple. Yeah, so I guess or maybe I've glossed person. over a small number of technical details. But I think this is a pretty good summary of it just a bit. And then you can prove some optimality results in a certain sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you actually run this program against uh, the universal distribution over possible worlds, it achieves optimal results. Okay. There's some issue coming from the fact that there's a, a horizon there. But yeah, over the first, if you look at just the first H steps, it achieves optimal mm -hmm. results. Okay, so that's, that's all for AXI. Um, and now, I guess one issue is that this, this model is like a very, it like artificially splits the world into the agent and the non-agent. Mm -hmm. Right, which is, in some sense, it's reasonable. This is sort of how you probably reason about the world intuitively. There's like the stuff going on inside your brain, the stuff going on outside your brain. Um, but this is really not cutting reality at like, a joint, right? There's like not actually like your brain and then interacting with a very low bandwidth channel with the world or even with a high bandwidth channel with the world. Right? Your brain is actually just like another thing that exists in the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is what I mean when I say that decision theories are Cartesian dualists still. Yeah. It's like a so this poetic is, way this to put like it. A, mm -hmm. a Cartesian dualist. Yeah. Um, just it's on one side, the world's on the other side. Yeah. So the goal is to now have an agent that is aware of the fact that it's just like more stuff happening in the world. Uh -huh. um, to motivate this, we can like see what happens to AXI if you build an approximate version and put it in the world. Right. Okay. So like if we're actually, um, I'm going to gloss over the details coming from the approximation of Slaminoff induction we used. Mm -hmm. right. So any any real agent that existed in our world at least that did Slaminoff induction wouldn't be able to like. There's no such agent. In Slaminoff induction. But we're going to gloss over the fact that we have to approximate it temporarily. So let's suppose we just like have this box running A. Right. Here's an input wire with like the reward signals or something going on that wire. Mm -hmm. and here's the output wire. Um, and there's like some sensors 
and then there's some other actuators over here. Great. Um, so when we and we make a this is an approximate axi. Also note that uh, in the axi paper they also define this thing uh, I don't even remember what they call it but something like axi tl, which is like explicitly uh, time and space bounded version of axi. Uh -huh. Um, we're not going to deal with that, which is perhaps uncharitable, but this should make clear what's the problem with dualism. So this is some approximate version of the AXI. It's like doing the same thing as the AXI with approximate and so induction and approximate planning, because you can't actually compute these maxes. Mm -hmm. um, and we imagine when we design this algorithm, we're sort of putting a box intuitively around A and calling the rest of this W. Right. Right. What we want is for A to learn a model of W. Um, so we want A to learn um, physics supplies values on in and takes values on out. Right. Mm -hmm. So outside of A, we're saying normal physics is just operating. Normal physics tells you what voltages go along this wire by looking at physics in the sensors. And uh, normal physics, once you've supplied the values on this output wire, normal physics say what happens in the actuators. And just inside A, we're applying this magic where it models itself using these, uh, mm -hmm. these arguments. OK, so the question is, do you actually learn this model? Right, if you have a bunch of observations, um, what sort of model do you acquire of the world? Um, this is obviously a very complicated model because physics is pretty complicated and the initial yeah. conditions of the world <laughs> are pretty complicated. You can still hope to learn it. Um, so it's worth pointing out, this is, let's call this model one. Here's model two. Uh, model two is just physics. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, so in this model, we say that physics was like putting something on wire. Well, sure. Physics supplies values on within. Um, so we were imagining like physics did this, and then the magic operation of A was giving the value of wire, um, voltages on the output wire, right? But instead, we could just imagine that A is not special anymore, and we just run physics for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. right? Physics to actually just correctly predict the behavior of A, if there's some reasonable model of physics. Um, so this, this model produces all the same observations as model one. Um, because it's just both of them are in agreement with reality and mm -hmm. what physics is doing, as long as like the sort of algorithmic characterization of what A is doing remains valid. Um, so these two models have a uh, one and two make the same predictions, right? Okay, so one observation is that model one. It's sort of a really odd model. Um, we sort of intended for the takes values on out part to be included in the model, mm -hmm. but this is just like a really arbitrary addendum, right? Like if you're trying, if you're a human trying to model the world, you could be like, well, it could be that my brain is operating behind this curtain, and then there's this magical non-physical law by which my brain like controls what happens in my, or my mind controls what happens in my brain, or my mind controls what happens in my muscles directly, or whatever. Right. Or you could just get rid of that. Okay. Okay. I see. And um, generically. That, that once you have a good enough understanding of physics, uh, this this term where you think that there's this non-physical law allowing you to intervene on the universe doesn't have oh, any right. explanatory value. I see, I see. And you can cast this out formally, mathematically, and say, that, like, if we start with this uniform prayer that uh, favors simpler programs, um, this program seems to be simpler in general. Mm -hmm. um, there are some issues, right? Like, one issue is, well, A can't really model itself, like, tautologically, because it only has so much power in right. itself is. But if the world contains other agents like A, right, like so A is chilling the world, in the world there are all these other agents though, like B, which is sort of about as hard to model as A, and C, which is very much like A and B. Mm -hmm. um, and A pretty much has to be able to like model what B and C are doing pretty well using physics. Um, so yeah, A has to have a good approximate model of B and C, and as long as its own behavior is, uh, yeah. Unless you do something special and go out of your way, it's going to have a similar ability to model itself approximately. 
And even if it can't predict exactly what it can do, it can still say, like, you can't predict exactly what you are going to do using the reductionist model. You can still say the reductionist model I know is uh, accurate. Mm -hmm. Like, you believe that as a mathematical fact, the predictions of the model are in accordance with everything you project. Yeah. Um, so any A that's, like, sophisticated enough to be able to entertain the hypothesis and put, like, non-zero probability on the hypothesis that uh, the physical model is capturing its outputs is going to be able to learn that model 2 is this, for this or is going to be able to uh, adopt model 2 over model 1. Uh, we could talk about, like, the sort of philosophical difficulties that would stop A from being able to realize that. But for now, let's just assume that uh, model 2 wins in the long run over model 1. Okay. Okay. So what does A do if it believes model 2? Like, what do you do if you believe that your choices have no effect on the world and you're just running physics um, to see what you do? Okay. Right, it's doing this, like, uh, in this expectation, it's, like, intervening to set the kth action equal to A. But in Model 2, like, reality doesn't care what, what this is equal to. Reality's just going to keep running physics. Mm -hmm. It's ignoring these outputs instead of putting them on this output wire. Okay, yeah. So in Model 2, it doesn't matter what A does. Physics is just going to keep running ahead. Right? And A is thinking about its interventions in this very particular way. It's thinking about its interventions by taking the world model it's learned, the mapping from inputs or outputs to inputs, mm -hmm. and it's seeing what would happen if it fed that world model a different value. But in model two, we're just ignoring, um, in model two, we're ignoring A's outputs completely. And so if, it, if you only use this particular strategy of looking at what different possible worlds are like, you're glossing, their worlds aren't different at all, because reality is ignoring what you say, and just using physical law to generate actual outcomes. Okay, so um, A's decisions have no have no consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that for decision making purposes, A can ignore model two, right? because in model two, it doesn't matter what A does. Right. So if you were uncertain about whether reductionism was true or non-reduction. And uh, you believed that or you were using this sort of dynamic to choose between possible actions. Um, you could just ignore the possibility that reductionism was true. Because you'd be like, if reductionism is true, it doesn't matter what I do, so I can concentrate on the non-reductionist possibility. Mm -hmm. I see. The problem is that there's also like these other models. Um, I mean, for one, that's really unsatisfying. But for two, there's another model, which is this model three, which is just like two. Unless A ever outputs... Some random sequence, right? One zero zero one one zero one zero 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 one one, and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So it can just have some random hardwired exception to model two. Right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so this in this model it does matter what A does. Um, so there are perhaps more natural forms of this. Like it could be like, like um, reductionism is true and everything is physical, but I'm still going to be rewarded if I make the right decision. Then you could have some completely arbitrary notion of what right is. So in this exception, perhaps something good happens to it, or perhaps something bad happens to it. Um, so we've discarded model two because it doesn't affect decision making, but models three and model one are both relevant. Right. So the evidence you have so far can't distinguish between any of these three models. In model two, your decision doesn't matter. In model one, your decision matters in an intended way. Um, but in model three, your decision matters in this completely arbitrary way. And it's actually like a whole class of models here, right? There's like a huge can number of exceptions. Can you repeat on. that? Why does it? So in model two, your decision doesn't matter. Because yeah. It's the in model one, it matters in an intended way. In model three, there's this random exception, right? And so you care about whether that exception is in force. You care about, like, maybe this model says, if you ever output 100 ones in a row, you get, like, a cookie. Uh, mm -hmm. And so then you're like, well, reductionism is probably true, so my actions probably don't have any effect on the world, except that if I output 100 ones in a row, I get a cookie. Okay. So in model three, you also care about the effect of your actions on the world, but in some really weird way. Right? It's, like, sort of pathological. Um, so we'd like you to believe model one instead of model three. Um, but the problem is, like, this part of model one, where it says takes values on out, like where we say that um, the world model listens to A, whatever A says, like magically it commits surgery on the world to cause the output wire to agree with it, that model is actually really complicated and unnatural. Right. Um, is that, like, given that physics is already producing the values on this wire, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this clause isn't supported by evidence, but it's also really mechanically complicated. Like, it's complicated to write down the program that, like, looks in the universe, finds this output wire, and then changes the value on it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Also, you could just as well be, like, changing the value some... Yeah. Um, 
Whereas this model is actually not that complicated. Um, if you're using like a normal human programming, so this, this distribution depends on the programming language. If you're using a normal human programming language, stuff like this is quite straightforward. You just have like one if statement, and you just check to one simple well, condition. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this just involves adding like one extra line of code. This involves adding a whole lot of code to interface with the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, and so it ends up that, uh, again, in simple mathematical models of the situation, this one's actually simpler than one. And so the behavior of this agent of A uh, just ends up getting dominated by it believes reductionism is true, and so its actions are meaningless, and then it just starts behaving completely erratically. Huh. Um, so this is sort of a simple description of what's wrong with having trying to adopt this dualist picture of the world. Right? It's not really compatible with uh, Occam's razor and normal inductive reasoning. Um, you tend to go crazy when you encounter reductionism. That's kind of weird. I didn't. I, I didn't see that. Um. Hmm. So then we get to decision theory. Okay. So like, what do you do as a human? Like, I I don't know about your philosophical orientation, but I assume you are on board with reductionism. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and yet, you still like decide that it's just, you should make choices in a certain way. Like, you right. care about outcomes, and you still make choices that systematically lead to those outcomes. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what do you do as a human? What sort of, well, not necessarily what do you do as a human, but like, what is a good like algorithmic solution for this context? Where in some sense you understand that your actions have no consequences. In some sense you understand that like, everything you're going to do is already fixed as a mm -hmm. mathematical fact. Right? This would be more severe if you knew your own source code. Right? Suppose you were an AI and you like, knew what your own code was. You know there's just like a fact of the matter about whether you output 0 or 1. Sure. And it's just like sort of frozen, and you can't change it. Like, yeah. No matter what you do, you're just going to do the thing that you were going to do. Right. So how do you reason in this context? That's the question. Okay. Um, so there's a very simple answer, um, which well, this is not very simple. This is easy. Probably. Um, so in UDT, you have like you have uncertainty. Let's say uh, you are a. So in particular, you like know your own source code. Right? Mm -hmm. You have like some distrib. I mean, you don't actually know your own source code, but you still have a distribution over like what your brain looks like. Right. right. You don't treat it as this mysterious thing. You you know what it is, or yeah. you know how you would learn about it in your distribution. Okay, but you still even once you know, um, even once you know your own source code, you still have uncertainty about what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you don't know whether what you do is um, output, like you don't know whether you output zero or output one, um, and you you can't know, sort of in some strong sense. But you can't always know. So you have uncertainty about your own output, even though it's a mathematical fact. Okay. Um, so in light of this, you have a probability distribution. So in your head, you have like some distribution over all these unknown facts about the world. Um, a joint distribution, so you have a joint distribution over, say, um, a bunch of things, but among them, um, A, let's put with parentheses around it, this is what you end up doing. Also, let's call it U. So uh, let's say U is the thing you care about. Um, so it's some function that represents the thing you value. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you, you know, if you like like paper clips, you could be a function that sort of simulated the universe and counted how many paper clips were in it, or something of this mm -hmm. form. Um, so so like like a u is a function which you're aware of. You like know what the definition of your utility function is, perhaps. Or in this context, we're going to assume you do. And you know there's like a mathematical fact of the matter about how the universe evolves. So there's sort of a mathematical fact of the matter about what your utility is. So in some sense, it's immutable, right? You can't change right, it. Right, right, right. a similar attitude to how you can't change your own action. You can't affect the utility. It's just yeah, there's some yeah, no, I understand. There's, there's some, yeah, function yeah. there. Okay. And so you're very uncertain about it. So, your utility. So you have this joint distribution over what you actually do and what your utility is and um, other stuff. And so the reformation of UDT really... What's the other stuff? Well, there's a bunch of other stuff in the world, just right? Like you have uncertainty oh, oh, about okay, whether okay, okay. your hypothesis is true. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Um, also about like facts of the matter. But, yeah. Um, so you have uncertainty about all these things, uh, and your uncertainty is correlated, right? So 
for example, you could know that um, you could know that if a equals zero, then u equals zero, and if a equals one, then u equals equals one. Right? You could know a fact like this or a collection of facts like this. Mm -hmm. um, and you could know this even if you didn't know what a was. Right. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know if I go down like this path, I get a bunch of money. I got this path, I don't. Yeah. Um, and the point is. A reasonable action to take is just take the one such that if you condition on learning that you're... This is actually evidential decision theory in some sense, but uh, evidential decision theory is like condition on the action such that upon learning that you took that action, your belief is that your utility is as high as possible. Uh -huh. So in this case, you would just condition on uh, action equals one. Um, the only distinction in update list decision theory is that you just treat all these things basically as mathematical facts. Um, so instead of saying the action that you took, where you is some vague indexical, we say that you sort of have beliefs about your own code. Um, and we say that uh, you condition on the fact that that mathematical algorithm that you're instantiating outputs this, gives this output. Um, and conditioned on that mathematical fact being true, you can then reason about this other mathematical fact. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And that, that's basically, I guess that was really evidential decision theory and require a little more discussion to say why evidential decision theory has some problems. And for the most part, you get around those problems by talking directly about this algorithm outputting one instead of about, like, the vague you outputting one. Mm -hmm. So that's UDT. Um, do you have any questions about that brief summary? Um, I mean, this is really straightforward. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Let's see. So what kind of problems does evidential decision theory run into? Yeah, so I guess... There are two natural directions to go. Um, one is to like clarify why we've defined things the way we have, so that would be looking at the problems evidence decision theory has. Another is to observe this is like not yet formalized. So we're actually going to run into a lot of problems as we try and formalize this really carefully, mm -hmm. which we also would run into with evidential decision theory if you try to formalize it. Um, so the common, I haven't thought too much about this, but like the common place that UDT fails is something like the uh, you know, smoking lesion problem. Is this the problem? Do you know the name of this? Uh... I think, yeah, it might be called a smoking lesion problem. It's some problem people in decision theory think about sometimes. So the basic issue is, suppose there are like two classes of agents, and one class of agents like likes candy and always dies early, and the other class of agents um, likes candy less. Okay. So then you can have situations where like, if you learn that uh, you took a piece of candy, you infer that you're more likely to be the sort of agent who likes candy a lot. Right. And then you infer, because the sort of agents like candy a lot tend to die earlier, you infer mm -hmm. that you're going to die earlier. Mm -hmm. Even though this seems sort of incorrect, in the sense that your decision to take the candy isn't really, like, it's not having any influence on whether you die earlier or not. Right. Um, and, yeah, the point is that by passing to this context where you look at the algorithm you're using directly, um, you, can, you don't get any more information of this form. Um, rather, you know the algorithm you're running, and the algorithm you're running is, like, operating...